on climate activism in all arenas. This uh, webinar is hosted by the CMI UIB, Center on Law and Social Transformation, Law Transform, and forms part of a master course at the Department of uh, Comparative Politics, which is called Law and Politics of Climate Governance. But since we are so lucky today to have four very active and interesting activists joining us, we wanted to open it up to others as well. The climate crisis is something that more and more people around the world are concerned with, see as a major threat, and that also politicians to a larger extent is dealing with. But a very important reason why this is higher on the agenda is the presence and creativity and strategy of climate activists. And climate activists work in very different ways, in very different arenas. And what we wanted to do today is to hear reflections from activists on their strategies, other people's strategies, and to show you the range of ways in which climate activism can happen, the forms it can take, and invite you to also reflect on what are the mechanisms that make climate activism more or less uh, efficient, that makes it change the way societies work in the longer and shorter term, and any suggestions for other ways that, that could also be, be, uh, be useful and interesting to engage uh, and push for change. So throughout this webinar, you are invited to write questions in the Q&A and we will, you can also ask to be allowed to speak and then we'll allow, allow that as well, if you want to post your questions in person. So our, the panel today is, I'm very excited to, to, and very interested in hearing what they have to say because it's a wide range. So starting out, uh, we have Teresa Boye from Natur uh, Ungdom, Friends of the Earth uh, Youth in, uh, in Norway, uh, very active with very many different strategies. So Teresa will, will take us through some of that. Uh, next is uh, Saul Mullard, who is a researcher in his daytime job at the Kinsan Mikkelsen Institute, but also a member of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, who will talk about their strategies, extinction rebellion strategies for, for pushing for climate change. The third panelist is Marianne Morel. Uh, Marianne Morel is also engaging in different forms of climate activism, but the main reason why we invited Marianne here today is that Marianne is an artist and also engages climate uh, in her art and has reflections around how art also plays a role or can play a role or can it in, 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 uh, in terms of climate activism. And last is Hanna Kvamsos, who is a colleague from the University of Bergen uh, and uh, is based at the SET, the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen. And we don't really usually think about researchers as doing activism in the research, but in terms of climate, a lot of climate researchers actually do in different ways. And Anna will talk to us about a special form of engagement uh, that they have called Climathon. So big range, very exciting. And Teresa, I want you to start. And remember to ask questions. Is it okay if I uh, show some pictures? Absolutely, just share your screen. Okay, so I think you can see it now. Yes, we can. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, I have been the head of Nature and Youth for a bit more than a year. Uh, and in that time, we haven't been able to work uh, exactly the way we are used to, but I will go through some of our ordinary ways to, to work with climate activism. Um, 
So <laughs> I'm just showing some pictures to, to demonstrate what I mean. Um, when I say um, one of the main strategies of, um, for us is to be uh, strict parents uh, for the politicians, to, to make connections with them and make them feel that uh, we are um, always watching <laughs> their decisions. And we have heard, for example, for this uh, from uh, Knut Aril Hareide, uh, head of transportation, that uh, after he, he quit his job as uh, um, minister uh, last time, he, he really felt that, wow, nature and youth is no longer watching me. And uh, he, he kind of missed that uh, when he came back to, to the department. So we are doing that by like uh, meeting them in a lot of places where they go, <laughs> uh, writing directed to them in the media, uh, arranging meetings with the media uh, where we can confront them. Um, when they are visiting somewhere in Norway, in Lofoten or in Tromsø, we, we always have people uh, who can show that uh, there are youth uh, depending on them doing a good job everywhere in the country. Um, often, often handing them gifts <laughs> so that they remember our message. Um, and also to just have a reason to meet them. So we can contact their, um, their um, assistants to say, we want to arrange a meeting so that we can hand over this gift. And it's a lot easier to, to meet people. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, not uh, being so nice when we meet them. Uh, it's easy to be too nice, so we try to to make some uh, arrangements where we are also meeting them on our own terms and being a bit too strict. Um, for example, uh, in, uh, giving them space in our own uh, annual meetings and just lining up all around the the room to to question them with really difficult questions. Um, yeah, and of course, not being so nice on social media either. Uh, try to, um, yeah, if they make some bad decisions, we, we try to make a bad, uh, um, yeah, spread, spread the word. <laughs> and of course, a part of this strategy is also to, to make useful for us the arenas that are already important for the politicians. Um, in Norway, we, we work a lot with this um, uh, hypocrisy from the government that they say one thing in international meetings and they, they do something else in Norway. And that is something we are trying to use a lot in our work by meeting them in the arenas that, that they want to have to to talk big about Nor Nor Norway as a climate country and and then we 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 are there to meet the press and the international uh, participants to to say otherwise and and they feel they have to to answer uh, to us uh, so that they show that show to the international press and, and participants that they they uh, are listening and so that can be in also in local climate uh, fights and, and in national climate issues. Uh, so if a politician is, is visiting somewhere, they often have their own message that this is something I want to get a lot of press uh, about when I come visit. And then we have to make sure that no, they get to press about um, something else that's important for us. So kind of a coup of their events. Um, yeah, many different ways to do that. Um, and another one of our strategies is maybe to um, a part of this connection with the politicians to, to make them feel that we are uh, watching them and um, that they yeah, to, to push, push, put pressure on them is to also invite them to celebrate what we are fighting for. 
uh, that can uh, often be uh, feel like a bigger pressure <laughs> than than standing and shouting at them. But if we celebrate together, they they feel they have to uh, work for a common cause. And of, yeah, we often arrange these celebrations for uh, not just what we're fighting against, but what do we want to protect uh, with mu music and food and <laughs> everything. Serving food uh, outside of the parliament is something we do often <laughs> uh, to celebrate sustainable fisheries, for example. Or uh, if one party, uh, for example, is against oil drilling in the Arctic, then we uh, <laughs> join their, uh, their events, their um, annual meetings and such to, to celebrate and, and uh, support them in the fight uh, against the other parties in, in parliament. Uh, and of course, the biggest strategy in nature and youth is to, to have people all over the country and uh, act locally while we are thinking globally. And uh, so, so the way we mobilize people locally is to, to make them engaged in, in local issues mostly. But, but we uh, of course work with big uh, national and international issues. And then we try to find a way to, to make them more local, to, to find like coordinated events or actions or yeah, for example, um, support uh, local groups that want to make art for something, for example, the climate lawsuits, uh, so that the talk in the local press is about um, something that happens locally, not just something that happens in Oslo. And that's a good way to put pressure on politicians and, and focus uh, in among people around the issue. Um, and of course, the climate lawsuit has <laughs> become one of our strategies, and that is a part of our work to, to find ways to talk about our demands um, to Norwegian politicians uh, on our own premises. Uh, so not just uh, go out and, and protest every time they hand out new licenses in the Arctic and so, so on, but also find ways to to yeah set the premises and our own terms to to talk about the issue um kind of um yeah it has where it was not just a um legal uh, strategy it was a, a big part of the climate laws it was how can we um make Norwegians talk about climate and oil in the right way and link them. Uh, yeah, and of course, civil disobedience is part of our strategy, um, but not in the daily work, uh, because we, we uh, have a lot of focus on that when we use civil disobedience, uh, this has to strengthen our message um, in the case we're working with uh, and strengthen the support we have among people and of course not the opposite so we have to have like a, a limited goal uh, with the civil disobedience actions so that it's really clear for for people uh, that's not involved that they are doing this to demand this um, and it's easier for people to support um, our cause and that we don't want our actions or the way we do something to get more focus than why we are doing it. So that's why we, we do it in not so often and, and very focused on specific issues or cases. Um, yeah, and lastly, a short few seconds about our limitations. Um, this is like mainly the way we work uh, to mobilize people. And this has to be linked with um, our political lobby work. 
so that we have uh, um, or people um, understand that we have um, backing for what we're demanding um, and that we have tried everything in the political work before we go to big actions. Um, and our limitations is maybe that because we work so uh, action oriented and uh, working locally with uh, specific issues and cases, uh, we put a lot of demand on the people we mobilize. It's not so easy to just be active in an organization by uh, sharing something on Facebook sometimes. So it's a, a big step to, to join our organization maybe. And um, maybe we don't get enough um, um, yeah, we don't uh, maximize the use we can have of the support and the members we have because we kind of have a limited way to work in our organization. Uh, many different people could probably uh, contribute in other ways, but we don't have so many um, activities other than our, our main focus. So you have to, if you want to do something, you have to do it yourself in our organization. So that's maybe a, a limitation that does, that makes us grow a lot um, slower than other organizations in, in Norway, I think. We are very focused on limited uh, issues at a time and not the big picture uh, all the time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Teresa. This was, uh, this was really, really interesting, amazing. Uh, I would like, uh, if any of you have any immediate questions, we will have a discussion after all the panelists, but if any of you have any immediate questions of clarification or something, you can, you can just let me know. Otherwise, nope. Otherwise, we will go from Naturungdom, Friends of the Earth, the youth, to Extinction Rebellion. So. Thank you, Siri, uh, and thanks for the invitation and this uh, webinar. I will just now share my screen. So um, Extinction Rebellion, this is a sort of brief introduction to who we are and uh, some of our strategies and methods. Um, I can't. So we are a nonviolent direct action civil protest organization, and our approach is primarily based upon climate science and academic research on the success of nonviolent protests. In particular, Erica Chenoweth, uh, who's a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School, and her work on why civil resistance works which shows that from 1900 to 2006, nonviolent uh, action was twice as effective as violent uh, movements. So why, what, what, what do we need to do is our sort of key question. And we, we're guided by several moral obligations that we believe that the climate crisis is so urgent and so pressing, it is our moral obligation to act uh, in order to, uh, to save our planet for all living beings, for future humans, for ourselves, and the right that we have as individuals to rebel in self-protection and to other living beings that share this planet. And we, our, our main strategy is based upon what has already been done before. So globally, if we look at uh, sort of environmental and climate movements, we have, of course, several key agreements and summits over several decades, the Rio, the Kyoto and the Paris Agreement. And locally, of course, like uh, um, 
the previous speakers talks about engaging with politicians doing uh, work through the courts or campaigning or individual actions, uh, those approaches have also been tried. But our belief is that these haven't been successful because if we look at this particular graph, after, for example, the IPCC was founded, CO2 emissions continue to increase. And therefore we need to have a different approach that is rooted in civil disobedience. And, you know, we, we also need to understand why those, why those strategies have not worked in the past. And part of this is because of the short termism of politicians that they are uh, act, they act based upon five, at best 10 year uh, uh, sort of foresight into the future because of their constant need for re-election. We also have a structural problem in our economic model, which is that capitalism has failed to cost the future. And we have a further problem that action against the climate crisis needs to be collective and global. And so we sort of propose as a, a new approach, which are based around our three core demands, which is that we need to tell the truth about the ecological crisis and declare a climate emergency. And whilst, of course, uh, uh, you know, there's more in the media about the, the, the state that the planet is in, and there are more open discussions like this one today about uh, the effects of climate change, we still need to be honest and, and we need to reflect that honesty in policy. And by that, that leads to our second demand, which is that we need to act now. If we go by the current agreements of setting targets by 2030 or 2050, we may already be too late to stop the worst consequences of the climate crisis and getting into perpetual feedback loops. And, and the third thing that we demand is that we have to go beyond politics because in a way, the political process, uh, particularly in countries like uh, the UK where trust in the state and in politicians has been severely eroded. We need to move beyond uh, uh, politics as usual with um, uh, uh, sort of <clears throat> powerful lobby groups special interests, and instead we need to strengthen our democracies through the use of citizens' assemblies to formulate policies and make agreements for how best to tackle this crisis. Now, in order to fulfill these three demands, we use civil resistance or nonviolent direct action as our principal strategy. And we base our, our strategy upon previous successes. For example, the Indian National Congress movement uh, fighting for Indian independence led by Mahatma Gandhi. And of course, the civil rights movement of the United States. <clears throat> so what elements of this strategy do we use? For us, the main principle of course, is that civil resistance and rebellion, it must be nonviolent. If it is violent, it is twice as less likely to be successful. And it is more likely to draw negative attention. And our organization can be labeled then as a, a bunch of anarchists rather than a bunch of concerned citizens who, who want to see a radical change in the way in which we deal with the climate crisis. But in order to be successful, we need a lot of people. We need thousands and thousands of people. In fact, Genoa's studies showed that you need about 2% of the of a national population in order to be guaranteed of success. And that's also, uh, uh, you also have to take into consideration the uh, silent minority or the silent majority that would support our actions but not necessarily take part in them. And we also believe that we need to be focused 
on the capital. We need to be where the power is, where the money is, and we need to be disruptive and we need to break the law in order to get attention to the cause and to prolong and uh, uh, as much uh, and inflict as much economic damage as possible, because we believe that it's only through uh, being physically present, physically disruptive on the streets that we can actually bring about the change that we need to see. And finally, they need to be fun. And it was nice to see that your uh, poster for this event focused on uh, one of our groups, the Red Rebels, which is uh, a sort of interpretive uh, uh, theatrical uh, performance art, artistic way of expressing this kind of uh, uh, disobedience that, that is the focus of our work. And we tend to try and uh, uh, bring together people, have interesting and exciting events going on whilst we are protesting, maybe a drama crew or audiovisual. And art is, of course, crucial to how we express ourselves and also how we sort of bring color and life to the work that we do. So our core activities then are actions. And here you see a picture of the pink boat in Piccadilly Circus in, in London during the Spring Rebellion of 2018. Uh, and this was at a time when in the UK was obsessed with Brexit. And yet uh, hundreds of thousands of people came out onto the streets to, to disrupt the everyday workings of that city. And, and we use then arrestables at the heart of our actions. People who, who make that personal sacrifice to break the law, uh, to, to actively um, disrupt uh, uh, everyday life, whether we are blocking a road, whether we are protesting outside the oil ministry or, or whatever it may be, to put them into a position where the police are forced to act harshly and to remove people physically from that, from that location. Because we believe that those images show the public that we're not actually dangerous. We're not trying to um, uh, uh, be violent, but instead we meet the police with peace and with love and with respect. Uh, and that's shown by, for example, this picture of this woman being taken away, smiling, happy, uh, and presenting to the world a picture of, of our activists making an ultimate sacrifice. But we don't just need everybody to get arrested. We also believe that um, for every person that is arrested, there needs to be a support network. And that's part of our values at Extinction Rebellion, that we believe that we need to represent also the regenerative culture and the regenerative economy that we wish to see in the future. And that we do this by, by creating support groups for each person that puts themselves on the front line. So we've also been quite successful, uh, at least up until the pandemic, of course, and this leads me to one of the obstacles that we're currently facing is that our principal strategy is to, to do things like this. Here we are in Torgal Menningen, um, uh, lying down in the center to represent the death and extinction of our planet if we continue as business as usual. We, we can't perform such actions uh, during this time of the pandemic. But prior to that, we have been successful. We have uh, closed down London on several occasions. We have uh, held rebellions in Bergen. We have uh, succeeded in having the Bergen Council declare a climate emergency. And we have also, uh, increased our membership in, in, in Norway and Scandinavia and beyond. 
So here are two of our actions that we did in, in Bergen before the pandemic. So the first one was the uh, a die-in where we laid ourselves down uh, uh, in front of the um, municipal building and the members of the Bustira had to come through and climb over our bodies in order to, to attend a meeting. And it was as a result of this and another action that targeted Bustira that uh, brought about the declaration of a climate emergency in Bergen Kommune. And the one on the right was uh, where we were swarming uh, on Bregen to, to disrupt the traffic uh, to, to again raise the issue of the importance of telling the truth about the climate and ecological emergency that we face. So thank you very much for listening and I hope I've uh, been able to go through some of our strategies and some of the uh, obstacles that we face. Thanks. Thank you so much, Saul. This was uh, this was also fascinating and a very fancy presentation as well. <laughs> <laughs> very creative. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, do any of you have any questions for Saul and Extension Rebellion at this point? If not, we'll just... Actually, it's interesting, Mariana, because we've already seen quite a lot of artistic expressions used as, as both by Natur Ungdom and by Extinction Rebellion. But you could say more about uh, the use of, uh, of art in, in, uh, as, as an arena and strategy for, for climate activism. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thanks for um, uh, inviting me here to uh, to talk about um, art as a climate um, strategy. I mean, it's quite um, obviously art uh, uh, is not one. It's not one thing, and so there's not just one strategy. You know, there's there's always. Uh, going to be lots of uh, individuals or uh, small groups of people who um, who uh, work in this way. Uh, and um, I think particularly, yeah, I mean, art has always been uh, used, you know, in, in uh, as a political tool, you know, historically as well, you know, we've, we've had various kinds of uh, propaganda and uh, ways in which perhaps the art has been um, used, you know, maybe uh, from uh, 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 above and down. Uh, but when we talk about art as a as a climate strategy, perhaps it it is something that is coming from the individual artist or the individual art group. Um, and so. Uh, you know, when we see things in uh, an Extinction Rebellion or uh, in other uh, 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 climate activist groups, um, I think it's very interesting that we, we get this quite strong focus on, uh, uh, on artistic expressions in, in, um, in these groups because um, I was thinking of, you know, how um, the, uh, uh, for instance, the American election and Brexit um, has impacted on how, how we think about uh, debate and climate, uh, I, I mean, uh, debate and, um, and arguments, you know, rational arguments. We kind of used to think that if only people are presented with facts, then they will, you know, be turned around and we can convince people or we can have a rational argument. But um, I think these two particular events especially has shown that that is in fact not the case and that people, uh, I think also there's been um, a few sort of research uh, studies that shows that, you know, rational argument is uh, completely overtaken by emotion. Um, and um, that is what governs our decisions uh, ultimately uh, and obviously art I think is um, a very powerful tool you know when it comes to talk uh, or to um, to address issues of emotion um, 
uh, another thing I th I've I've thought about, um, you know, of artists and how artists work is that um, I used to always think that you know artists are a little bit like a like a chameleon, you know, we because we a lot of <laughs> a lot of us. You know, we don't have a, a, we don't have a lot of money, but we don't we might have a lot of um, cultural capital or knowledge or education, and so there's quite a big span in um, in who we can engage with. You know, we can easily move in very different um, parts of society, um, and in a way. Uh, build trust and build uh, connections with people um, and in that way um, examine you know what goes on uh, that might not be obvious to everybody uh, but also uh, to bring out different perspectives that um, uh, you know deserve attention and because artists are such a diverse group, you know, you get uh, obviously that individual's particular uh, thoughts and reflections on, on a particular issue. And it can be so wide ranging. Um, so that's the, you know, that, I think that's what goes, what goes on in the actual process of making art, making work. Uh, but then also, obviously, there's the what goes on between the work itself and the audience, which is the, you know, the direct communication of, you know, emotions or thoughts or reflections. So how can you uh, impact someone through your work? Um, uh, and, and that kind of leads to the next level, I think, where you... Um, uh, you have to involve uh, a, a different sort of in infrastructure, you know, of um, galleries and art fairs and universities and museums and press, uh, where the work can be shown, exhibited, talked about, put into a context and disseminated and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, put into a history of art or into um different um uh, you know uh, arenas like for instance to talk about climate change um and um there are some examples you know of all of these things obviously you know you where you have uh, there is um um a small group here in bergen which uh, i think they think of themselves as um, uh, you know, climate activists or, or an art uh, group that work particularly with, as a climate uh, activist group, uh, which is the green hijab uh, uh, movement. And they have this uh, 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 reality TV uh, show. I think you can see it uh, on YouTube where they, um, uh, they discuss uh, you know, a, in a kind of almost philosoph philosophical way, um, you know, what, what is it that is happening to us? Um, and then you have a larger uh, scene, perhaps like um, uh, UCA, the Office of the Contemporary Art, um, they have curated a show in Oslo uh, now recently. Um, uh, which is called Art and Solidarity, where they show um, lots of different artworks, but it, it, um, it uh, also integrates this aspect of, uh, you know, uh, indigenous peoples and poverty, um, because all of these things are, are important parts of addressing climate change. Um, and, uh, uh, and also uh, the um, uh, Taipei Biennial that I participated in just recently, um, which, uh, you know, is, um, um, is an art fair or uh, ex uh, exposition where 
uh, a lot of different artists from very, very many backgrounds from the whole world um, have addressed uh, climate change, um, but it's being uh, curated in such a way that, um, uh, you know, the artworks sort of start talking to each other and start making narratives. And I think this is a way that, um, you know, can really sort of bring out the issues to, uh, to a lot of people. You know, it has a very, very wide remit. Um, so, so um, you know, that's, that's a, a, a little bit about how I think the, the actual infrastructure of being a, <laughs> uh, of working with climate change as an artist. But um, I think also, you know, it's worth um, thinking a little bit about what it actually means to be an activist. Because uh, like both um, Teresa and, um, uh, and Saul have already uh, spoken about is, you know, the, the various uh, strategies as, a, as an activist actually requires quite a lot of strength, you know, to be able to stand in this uh, confrontation um, is a very, very, um, it's a tough position to, to have. And so you have to uh, constantly be prepared to, to argue with people who, uh, who are in opposition to you. Um, whereas an, as, a, as an artist, you, you, can, um, you can sort of let the work do the job, as it were. Um, and you can also um, use the work to not just address the uh, problems or the issues that we are fighting uh, at the moment, but we can also use the work to uh, to sketch or to visualize um, new narratives, you know, ideas about what could it be like or what would it be like if, you know, what do, would we like, where would we like to be, uh, what are the values that we in, um, are investing now, what are the values where, that we want to, um, to keep. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very important role, I think, that art has, um, you know, where the creative thought can really, you know, come, come to the fore. Um, so how do... <laughs> How do you think art can bring change or affect change? Um, I, uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, a little bit of what I've already talked about. Obviously, I think that, you know, you can, uh, you can hope that it has the effect on somebody who, uh, you know, listens to it, watches it, reads it, um, that they that it, there is an engagement there with uh, with people's uh, you know emotions or thoughts or fears or hopes and desires, um, uh, or, or that it leads people to reflect on a part of society that maybe they hadn't uh, given much thought before. Um, uh, but. Um, I think that there's also a different aspect to it, which is about, um, perhaps particularly in Norway, uh, I have to say, <laughs> but, but it's to do with, uh, with funding and how the arts uh, are funded. Um, because a, a lot of art uh, in Norway is, is, is publicly funded and artists have to um, you know, apply for money to, uh, to carry out their projects. Uh, and I think in recent years, you know, we'll find that uh, an increasing number of uh, projects are addressing climate change. Um, and this did actually result in uh, the Cultural Council um, a few years ago, uh, they launched 
some new grants that were, uh, you know, sort of green, uh, you know, where, um, uh, you know, artists were encouraged to uh, apply for funds or for projects that were to do with um, um, uh, climate change. So, in in one way, that is very good because it it, it sort of shows that perhaps the the actual impact of the um, of the projects, the sum of all of our efforts, are being taken seriously in some way, um, and. Uh, has resulted in some kind of uh, financial <laughs> backing or uh, breakthrough. But on the other hand, you know, I actually, I never applied for those funds because I, I thought that it had a very unpleasant um, sort of tinge to it that uh, it could actually be seen as trying to instrumentalize art, you know, um, and that it um, could easily make art not free, uh, which, you know, like research, I think that is a, is a, is a hugely, it has to come first, you know, the, the, the freedom to make the work has to be uh, the, the where it comes from, uh, it's very difficult to um, order <laughs> a, a, um, a deliverance of, of art. Um, so um, uh, yes, uh, what are the main obstacles and limitations? Um, I think for art, uh, it's obviously um, not, uh, it's obviously that art has a very limited um, uh, audience, you know, we have a limited access to, to people, a limited access to, to press, to funds, etc. Um, but um, you know, so so it's always a constant, but that's not just uh, w with regards to climate change. That is a, a <laughs> is a, a, um, a trait that is there. You know, regardless of what we talk about, I think, but uh, a, a broader cultural problem. Um, so there is a chance that we will always, to some extent, be talking to people who are broadly on board, anyway. You know, or who would be easier to persuade. Um, but you know, I think also there is a uh, there's a hope in that. You know, I I, I do believe in this chameleon or this uh, kind of undercover <laughs> uh, quality of art that uh, that it has the the you know under the guise of um, you know of of beauty or, uh, you know, aesthetics and all of these things can actually uh, access something uh, and someone uh, that perhaps, you know, other forms of activi activism can't do uh, or quite so easily do. Thanks so, a lot, Mariana. This is, uh, this is fascinating. And, and the panelists have already, uh, Saul has already started commenting on you in the in the chat. So I would like to take to pause there and take and 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 have a little bit of a discussion around this because because I mean really really interesting reflections and also both Extinction Rebellion and and uh, Naturungam were very consciously also using different artistic expressions in activism. So, 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 so what is it that we can reach through, what is it that we can reach through art? And why is this important? So, so I, I want you to, to sort of start and, and, uh, and, and make some of your points. So, Me? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, no, I, I just was reflecting on what you're saying. And I think, um, Mariana, you were saying something that I think is crucial in uh, any kind of work on, on the climate crisis. And that's 
the role that emotions play. I mean, if we actually think about this, um, you know, if we actually really think about what the climate crisis means, uh, it's absolutely terrifying. And, um, you know, um, we, we, uh, we need to be able to discuss and express these emotions that, that arise. And I think art is obviously a very good way in which we can, can do this. But one question that I've sort of had, uh, and it's also about activism in general as well, is how do we ensure that, that both art and activism is accessible to all? Because we are also sitting here in quite a privileged position. Uh, you know, we're all reasonably well educated in a in a developed country um, with freedom of speech and and all of these issues. So, how how do we ensure that that um, that you know art and activism becomes accessible and 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 can help people in in those parts of the world where the climate crisis is already having such a huge impact uh, uh, to, to deal and to emotionally respond with, with this, with, well, with what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, it's a terrible and, uh, you know, very, very difficult um issue you know um it, it is true you know what you're saying is we you know we are in a in an incredibly uh privileged uh position and just to be able to be allowed to to make uh art uh, you know obviously is a is a huge privilege um so um i think you know in a way we have to work uh particularly, you know, I think to the, the, the bodies that are able to disseminate, uh, you know, art, uh, you know, uh, to a larger audience. And that is obviously the media, um, universities, and um, all the kind of infrastructure uh, around us, uh, because they have such a, you know, schools, education system, all the, those things that we have already implemented uh, that are there in order to educate people and that are there in order to, uh, you know, entertain or to bring culture to, uh, out to people. Um, those, those channels actually already exist and we don't have to reinvent them, but we do have to gain access to them. Um, and that is... Um, I think difficult. I mean, the arts organization only, you know, a couple of weeks ago launched a, a complaint to uh, Anarcho uh, because of the, the bias uh, that Anarcho has uh, against, you know, art. So um, it, it is a continued struggle. But I also, I, I also want to sort of, there is another perspective on this as well, which is that in some ways, if we look at art, to include uh, fiction, fiction films, for instance, uh, other popular art, uh, popular music, it has in a way a bigger reach than most other forms of, for sure, than science. As, um, so that would be, so, so I'm just thinking that art is, I like <laughs> you were also reflecting on what is activism, but also sort of what is art? What are we talking about when we talk about art? Um, is because what we're seeing now is that climate change issues are also entering popular art in a much more, uh, much more than it did some years back. So you will have like blockbusters who have also to some extent to deal with. With uh, with climate change in, in one way or another, would that is that something? I mean, does that address your concerns all, or is it sort of big capitalism just sort of entering, <laughs> uh, doing its way its work in other ways? Well, yeah, it's a bit of a poison chalice that one, but I think um, I think I think what you say is right actually, Siri. Uh, that that there is 
an increased focus in um, you know, sort of popular media, blockbuster movies, you know, Netflix and, and all of that, that that takes um, climate change or apocalyptic scenarios as the starting point for, for the plots and, and, and stories and narratives that they develop. I think, um, I think it can have a positive and a negative effect. It can actually raise these issues in, in much the way that in the 90s and, uh, you know, there was a move in, in Hollywood to, to talk about homosexuality and things in movies, which has maybe led to increased uh, uh, sort of liberal attitudes around sexuality and identity issues. Maybe that may be a positive effect, but another effect may be that it is also sort of trivializing it, right? You know, it's making it a source of entertainment rather than uh, a, a sort of serious discussion. Um, and I think when you're dealing with something of such catastrophic proportions as the potential extinction of the human species, I think we also need to balance this with um, with uh, 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 sort of emotional reflections as as a society, uh, and not just sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, commercial uh, uh, media. But but yes, I, I it can maybe have some some benefits to to further. Uh, uh, bring this up on the agenda, but you know our view in Extinction Rebellion is that we don't have much time left, and we have to act now, and we have to really uh, implement policies with immediate effect to to limit the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, and if it's going to take ten or fifteen years for us to change those attitudes through um, the popular media, then that's not really enough time. Thank you, so. I think we need to sort of, we'll, we'll just leave this discussion now. We may come back to it later, but we have one more presentation um, uh, which takes us into a totally different terrain. And I think maybe a terrain of activism that most people haven't even, that's more invisible and that most people haven't really thought about. So Ahana, please. Hello, I'll just share my screen as well. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Hanna Klamsos. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Bergen. And uh, I'm going to talk about how we are using collaborative hackathons or climathons as we have called them uh, to co-produce climate knowledge uh, with a goal of uh, creating actionable knowledge. And uh, Climathon is uh, one of very many different approaches to co-production as a research method. And uh, what's important uh, with co-production is that it acknowledges how scientific knowledge is created through uh, interaction between the very many different actors involved in research. Uh, it's especially relevant uh, in areas where the division between uh, policy and science is blurred, like the, the climate field. And co-production approaches very often intend to democratize knowledge creation processes through a better inclusion of non-scientific actors. Uh, and in Climathon, uh, the way we work, uh, we understand co-production as a deliberate collaboration to achieve a common goal. Uh, so why did we start with these climathons in the first place? Um, uh, the first one in 2018 came out of uh, a set of uh, different multidisciplinary projects where we had experience of how challenging uh, cross-sectoral collaboration in knowledge was. 
Um, this was a range of projects that uh, intended to downscale uh, climate data so that municipalities could use um, local climate data in their municipal planning. Uh, but it turned out that it was both difficult to downscale the global climate models, but it was especially hard uh, for the people in the municipalities to translate this climate knowledge into something that they could use in their plans and in their climate work. Uh, so uh, Klimathon in 2018, uh, it was um, devised to improve the co collaboration and knowledge, knowledge exchange between different institutions, uh, between different practitioners, sectors and governance levels. So we were trying to ease the collaborations between science and uh, politics and also between the different uh, parts of science, like social science and natural science. Uh, and to go into what's a hackathon, uh, the word itself comes from hacking and marathon. Uh, and traditionally, it's been associated with coding and software development, uh, but it's increasingly used in other areas like urban development and social science. And uh, in a hackathon, uh, we aim to develop new solutions to a predefined problem within a limited time frame. So, for example, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, traditional elements of a hackathon is competition. Uh, creativity is very important. Uh, autonomy in the working groups, because in the hackathon you have um, groups working together, even though you can have a big event, but there are many different groups forming and working together. Uh, very often there is a sort of a goal of uh, obtaining networks and maybe even funding. Uh, so when you're working, it's very often to uh, create software uh, or develop an app or something like that. So of course we have changed this format to work with it uh, for scientific purposes. So for us, uh, climathons are collaborative workshops where we um, uh, try to solve a common goal concerning uh, local climate adaptation issues. So, for example, the competitive element is completely gone. And uh, we've had three climathons. The first one in 2018, we had one in 19 and one in 20. The last one, the two first were physical and the last one was digital. And the first two uh, focused on sustainable municipal planning and how to use climate knowledge in municipal planning. Uh, the last one focused more on climate risk. Um, the group work is the core of uh, the climathons, and we aimed for a very broad representation of relevant, relevant participations in these groups. So we wanted to bring together the municipal planners, the county municipality, uh, the county governor, so the state level, uh, we had some private consultants and actors and even some very few NGOs. Uh, I think the first one had a bit more than 70 participants and the next one was almost 100 and the last digital one we had around 60 participants. So it's been like 10 to 12 groups in each of the, each of the events. So these groups, uh, they represent the most relevant actors working within the Norwegian adaptation field. Uh, and this frames the hackathons as a qualitative experiment in a realistic but not real setting, because we have the real actors and we have uh, pre-designed tasks, tasks uh, the assignments. Uh, that's very close to real problems, but of course we put all of these people in a constructed um, constructed setting uh, to get these discussions. And one of the main goals is that we give the participants time to discuss so that they can understand or we can understand because we as scientists also participate, understand each other's daily working reality, roles and responsibilities. Uh, and this is a picture from one of the result sections, uh, because arranging these hackathons for scientific purposes, uh, they need very systematic preparations. 
And uh, since the Climathons built on former projects that we had, uh, we had a network to start with. And this is a uh, very, very important uh, part of uh, the whole process, especially um, we have one partner in the Vestland County, formerly uh, Hordaland County and Sognefjordane County. Uh, they were sort of representing the non-academic actors from the beginning of planning and all through the process and to the end. Uh, and this is a very important part of the democracy aspect that we as scientists don't design uh, a workshop alone and then invite in non-scientific actors and then leave them out of it after. Uh, we want this to be a collaboration that lasts and develops over time. And then uh, what these Climathon dialogues reveal uh, is the participants' collective understanding of local adaptation and governance in Norway. And this kind of co-production uh, in collaborative hackathons can be useful for understanding uh, local adaptation in ways that recognize the complexity of the factors that affect climate governance processes. Uh, and what we see using this method is that there are uh, significant disagreements and very many divergent understandings of the relevant laws, regulations and responsibilities. And there is a lot of um, what we see in the groups when we put them together is that uh, people really appreciate this time to get together and just sort of find out what everyone else is doing. Like a municipal planner in his or her normal workday don't necessarily have time or possibility to sit down with one from the county level or the county governor and ask about all, uh, all of the competence and knowledge that exists on the other levels. And the same, of course, for all of us. Uh, so this provides... Um, so even if uh, the climathons, they don't dissolve these divergences, but they do allow the different actors to renegotiate and discuss boundaries between uh, the many different knowledge communities. And uh, of course, there are some limitations that even though we are trying this approach to democratize knowledge creation, uh, there are still asymmetrical relationships uh, in the process. And even though we are trying to bring in different actors and non-scientific actors in, in, in the whole process, there is still a tendency that it is the, the scientists uh, who define the questions in the end. And maybe especially uh, after the events, when we're doing the analysis and writing uh, we, we try to amend this by inviting in um, the different actors to comment on the things that we are writing. But of course, uh, it's, it's uh, one of the challenges that we have to work with all the time. And as a last question, one thing that we don't really know that much about is the actual effect after each of these climathons, because we can have assumptions about uh, what kind of networks the people and the participants got or what kind of ideas that were discussed, but we don't really know a lot about uh, what actually happens when they go back to their municipalities and their daily lives, because it's definitely possible to um, attend a hackathon, discuss, find solutions and then go back uh, and do exactly what you were doing before you attended the, the climathon. And yeah, I think I'll just leave it there and we can continue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, I want to ask again first if any of the panelists or anyone in the audience have any sort of particular questions to, to Anna um, or to any of the panelists, uh, because now we'll just also open up for a broader discussion uh, to, 
to uh, discuss these issues around strategies, what can different arenas be used for, for and what can we learn across? I think that it's also, that's also something that is, is, is uh, very important to discuss. Uh, but Hanna, one of the things that I was wanted to ask you, this is something that most of us haven't thought about. Uh, do you, when you, when you engage in this, um, do you think about this as, as a form of climate activism? I mean, you talk about this as research, as a way to generate knowledge and to generate research. But in the end, you also said that, so we don't really know what the effect is, but that means that you haven't thought about it being something that has effects. So could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I have a background uh, before this as working with something else called action research. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a form of research that very specifically goes, uh, has a goal of uh, activism in the research. Um, and I see very many links or parallels between the action research approaches and these co-production approaches. And then, of course, uh, <laughs> in academia, there will be a lot of people who agree and disagree uh, with this. Uh, but one of our main goals is creating actionable knowledge. And that is, uh, we can define that as knowledge that is possible to use, like it needs to be practical, it, it needs to be um, people who are not academics has to be able to use it in their daily work. And uh, of course, this, I think this makes this uh, sort of an activist approach, because we are definitely not saying that knowledge is um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it it's subjective. It's not ob objective. We as researchers, we're not standing somewhere watching someone and then trying to say something about what they're doing. We are engaging with the different actors and we're acknowledging that um, the knowledge that we create uh, needs have very many different voices and we have to uh, present also all of these other voices. So I don't know if that really no. answers. No, it. no, I think that is interesting. And I also want to ask the rest of the panel to reflect on this, sort of to what extent do you see these climathons, uh, this form of, of sort of co-production of knowledge, to what extent do you see this as, as, uh, as activism? And um, I also want, before I give the word to Marianne, who is first, I would like to again ask the, the attendants if you have questions, to so just write it in the Q&A. Marianne. Uh, I think it, this uh, was very interesting to hear about the, uh, the climate zones, and it, um, I think it has also resonance with something that um, uh, Extinction Rebellion has been uh, working on for uh, some time the, to, um, uh, to find a way to, um, to democratize, um, you know, how we, um, how we get, you know, uh, as many voices into this debate as, as possible and, uh, and also to impact uh, decision making. Uh, how can you democratize it? Um, and so I wondered if the, these hackathons, if they, if they, you know, <laughs> this this um, sort of open-ended uh, version, is it possible to have some kind of, um, you know, uh, a, a goal or, you know, some kind of, um, a, a, you know, agreed upon solution or, some, yeah, something that we are trying to arrive at uh, together that, that is actually um, obligating the participants in some way? Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you. That's uh, that's very interesting reflections. Um, uh, Teresa or Saul, do you have any any thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, thank you, Hanna, for that really interesting presentation. It 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 did sort of spark uh, something in my mind, uh, at least in terms of the methods of how uh, the individual sort of uh, climathons take place, and and that is towards uh, Extinction Rebellion's third 
demand, which is the citizens assembly, which is essentially the idea of convening uh, a representative sample of uh, the population to discuss uh, not only the facts of climate change, but also what should be the policy outcomes. What, what kind of policies should we be proposing to actually meet the targets that are set in uh, various international agreements or to meet XR's um, uh, demand of a 2025 uh, reduction in CO2 emissions. So I did see some parallels there in, in methods and I guess that's kind of what Mariana was, was touching upon about uh, rather than sort of just having it as a, as a sort of research outcome, but how could we then use this sort of method to, to arrive at formulation of policy? Uh, and yeah, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah. So Tres, I wanted to ask you something in particular, because in some ways you were talking about how you try to engage decision makers particularly. So in some ways, the, so of course, both, both Extinction Rebellion and art and sort of different forms try to engage decision makers, but you have strategies that engage decision makers most, much more explicitly rather than sort of also more ge the general public. So you do both, but you have a, a different way of engaging. Um, do you see uh, so, so in a way, sort of the, the the hackathons engage bureaucrats, which is is sort of who actually make a lot of decisions, and 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 um, uh, it, well, not only bureaucrats, but but also a layer of decision makers that we don't necessarily engage with so much through activism. Otherwise, uh, how do you see this? Is this is there something in this that also? It's interesting from the perspective of, of Natura Ungdom that you also sort of see potential in. Yeah, of course, we we work a lot uh, locally with connecting with bureaucrats often and we have um, like uh, courses for our members on how to to uh, um, how to work with local issues. Um, and one of the reasons is that we often see that the lack of communication between different parts of, of the munic municipalities and uh, between the parties and everything, it, it's a big problem and, um, and it often gives, often gives us kind of a, a wake up call that, wow, there's actually no one uh, pulling the strings to, to, to reach different goals mm -hmm. uh, someone is working with this and they they don't work together with <laughs> mm -hmm. others um, so we see that some of our meetings with for mm -hmm. example bureaucrats um, um, impact that uh, to mm -hmm. to make them realize that uh, they have a lot of more um, room and power in their positions than than they really thought. Mm. Um, so I definitely think that these kind of new arenas to 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 learn more about how other people work and what mm. room there is to mm. to cooperate is is really important. Mm. I also had another question for you that I was uh, that I'm I'm really really that, yeah I mean you were discussing your the 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 um, uh, court case that you had, and and of course in the aftermath of the high Supreme Court judgment, there has been sort of a lot of different assessments of whether this was a success or whether it was a failure, whether it's going to make things easier or make things more difficult and to go forward. And you touched on it a little bit, but can you say a little bit more about what do you feel that you how, how do you look at that? Sort of, would you have done it again? Would you have done it differently? Or do you think you achieved what you wanted? Where do you go from here? And so on. Yeah, thank you. Um, the climate court case for us, it was 
trying to, there are so many different uh, things we wanted to achieve uh, at the same time. Uh, so what do we do with this? Um, um, Grun love. Um, constitution. Constitution. <laughs> How do we make the most of this when we have this uh, paragraph in the constitution? Uh, and also, uh, we have a short time <laughs> to, to solve the climate crisis and, and get Norway on board more. So how do we uh, achieve mostly, uh, most, the most politically? Um, so there were a lot of discussions about, should we start with like a small case and build up this constitution so that we can use it against, for example, Arctic oil in the future? Or, uh, or should we go straight to the <laughs> big case? And, and of course, we, we ended up with taking a, a difficult case. It's about emissions that we don't know if ever will happen. <laughs> um, um, and it's about what kind of climate the, um, policy should Norway have. It's not, it's not just about what, what climate targets, and what's our ambitions, but also how do we, what, um, what kind of climate, climate policy should Norway have? So, so, and the reason behind that was partly because uh, the biggest impact we could have on the global climate is to um, put pressure on the supply of um, fossil fuels, uh, and particularly in Nor Norway. Um, and the way we can do that is to change the debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we think that the, the debate in Norway about oil and, and climate has completely changed since 2015. And uh, there's many reasons, <laughs> climate strikes and, and, and the really um, serious um, climate uh, reports getting worse and worse for every year, of course, that contributes. But I think also the climate lawsuit has, has done a lot about linking uh, climate and, and oil in the debate. And yeah, in 2015, if uh, Norwegian politicians were talking about oil in the media, they could, they could just talk about oil. But now you never see a journalist questioning anyone about oil without uh, bringing up climate by themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2015, we had to work so hard mm -hmm. calling all the journalists saying, how can you write about this without writing about climate? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have come a lot further and it's now possible for us to work uh, with oil in a completely different way today than we could before the climate mm -hmm. court case because the debate has, has changed and we can talk about how and uh, not um, just if, uh, there is an uh, issue. Um, and of course, how would we do it again? Was it worth it? We have definitely landed on that it was worth it and that um, the disappointment in losing, maybe it was a bit exaggerated because it couldn't uh, really be expected for us to to win even though we really had a good case but but if you if you read uh, in the judgment from the supreme court you, you really should uh, compare it to what the um, state said and not compare it to what we said because mm -hmm. what, if you compare it to what we said it's a great loss um, and you can question this if we achieved anything. But if you compare it to what the state said, then we have come a far away in mm -hmm. saying that we have a right. Norway has a responsibility for the emissions from our oil. Um, the, um, the climate, no, the oil um, licenses can be stopped because of climate uh, in by the parliament and, and other uh, small wins like that that we shouldn't take for granted and that actually can help us. Um, and of course, just the fact to, to have uh, shown Norway that um, there isn't laws that can 
um, protect us always. The, there, there is no, um, it's not obvious that politicians uh, have to solve the climate crisis. They can get away with not doing it. So there's a lot of uh, pressure and responsibility on us because it's no, uh, we don't have uh, an insurance that politicians will manage to take the uh, unpopular choices that is needed. Thanks a lot, Teresa. I see that our time is actually running out, but I have a question from the, that I will ask all of you to comment on uh, at the end from Ida Maria, who says, thank you so much for a great lecture. This, uh, this question, she says that this question mainly go to Extinction Rebellion and Naturungdom, but I think it can go to all of you. Uh, how much attention do you pay to other organizations working with the same goal as yourselves? Uh, which I think can also be about how do you collaborate, but also how do you get ideas and so on. How much, how much do you think about the broader activism? Um, and what would you put forward as your most efficient type of action? So what, what do you think is most important of what you do? And I think maybe I will start with Hanna because she's first in my screen and then go to Hanna, Marianne, Saul, and Teresa. Hanna. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I think we pay a lot of uh, attention to other organizations as uh, other organizations are the people that we're trying to reach um, as academics. Um, but our most efficient type of action, I guess, I really do believe in the Climaton format. Uh, and I just want to uh, point out that this is a format that can be changed and is changing, has changed for uh, for all the three years that we have uh, have had it, and it can be used by anyone and designed for different purposes. And I think it was very good comments from Mariana and Saul as well about, um, yeah. Uh, I actually started started thinking like how could we, how could we use this to to make the participants more responsible? Of course, one of the directions that's been called for by the participants that has already attended our climatons is bringing politicians into the mix. Uh, and that's been done to a certain extent, but uh, there is a lot of potential there, I think. And also I think it's interesting to think about this maybe as in conjunction with, or this as part of a strategy in conjunction with the citizen assemblies, for instance. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you Anna. Marianne. Um, yes, uh, I, as an artist, I think I, I, I pay a lot of attention to what uh, uh, environmental organizations are doing. Um, and uh, I am very grateful to them. I have to say, I am very, very grateful to them for, for uh, you know, standing uh, in the storm, uh, as it is uh, a lot of the time. Um, uh, I... Uh, you know, take a lot of inspiration from that, but uh, but also it's, it becomes important to um, to recognize what your own tools are uh, and how you can do the job that you can do. Um, it's not for everyone to be a, a direct uh, to think carefully about how we how we use ourselves uh, for all these things. Um, uh, I think as artists, uh, it would be great to um, participate in the climathons. <laughs> um, I think that's one of the things, actually, that, you know, artists can be employed in, uh, in many, um, you know, in many respects. Uh, and just being used to thinking perhaps, uh, you know, in, yeah, literally outside the box and outside the framework or the rule book. Uh, and to be able to think, uh, you know, into the future, perhaps, or, uh, or think on things that don't yet exist, um, I think are uh, how artists can really be put to use in this. Thank you, Marianne. Very, very good reflections. So. Thank you. Um, yes, of course, we we do keep an eye on what other people are doing. And uh, we do also um, uh, work with other environmental organizations. Uh, we 
we're involved, for example, with Klima uh, Puella, uh, and uh, we individuals from from our membership, of course, also participate in uh, a variety of different groups. And um, you know, I think it's important that whilst we could get bogged down in uh, what divides us, in the sense of which strategies we use to to pursue and bring about change, because that's the name of the game. We need radical change if we're going to uh, survive this crisis, actually. Um, uh, you know, we, we have to work with other people and we have to have these kinds of discussions with, with other organizations about our own uh, ideas. Um, and that's, that's crucially important to bring a sort of, uh, you know, to create a consensus of, of action. And our organization is, we're very inclusive and we just have those three demands and anybody who agrees with those is welcome to support our actions and we open our arms out to others that wish to support as well. Uh, I think some groups are less willing to do so because they see us as perhaps the radical fringe of the environmental movement. Um, uh, but, you know, we're always willing and open to, to discuss with, with all, all groups that are concerned with this crisis. In terms of our most effective action, I think the actions that we've done that have brought about the greatest success have been those that are honest and talk about uh, uh, or, or present a sort of emotional response that our planet is dying, it's under threat. We, if we do not do something about the situation, uh, our children and our grandchildren will be living in a very different place. And that is absolutely terrifying. And when we make, when we perform actions that are honest about these emotions and about how we feel as individuals, but also as members of Extinction Rebellion, about what this means for my own children or potential grandchildren, uh, and we link that with our actions, then actually the general public tend to support us. And this was the case in, in, in the UK, that despite uh, you know, conservative politicians trying to label us as a bunch of hippies, you know, uh, actually survey results showed that there was wide support within the United Kingdom for those actions. And that's because we target our actions to, to to real life emotions, to real uh, uh, feelings that people may be thinking or feeling about this situation. And I think that is perhaps our most effective strategy. Thank you, Zoe. And then the last word to you, Teresa. Yeah, um, of course we pay attention to other organizations and we try to have a balance on how much we cooperate because we see the big value of a diverse movement and, um, and we want the politicians to feel that they are um, being attacked from many fronts <laughs> and, uh, and so we try to coordinate like political demands uh, sometimes just uh, so that we make sure we we don't confuse politicians so that if if it's like a um, um, yeah, it's an important issue at uh, the time. We we maybe coordinate a bit on um, how do com do we communicate so that it, we don't uh, demand uh, conflicting things uh, on the same issue, uh, but uh, still don't uh, gather us too much so that they feel that there it comes from many fronts. Um, yeah, so I think. It's really good in Norway that there are so many different organizations and different places to, to get organized. And that that's a strength in Norway compared to very many other countries. Um, uh, yeah. And when it comes to what's our uh, biggest strength or the best actions we have, I think um, the, the most successful things we do is when we build up 
like these simple cases <laughs> uh, that gets a lot of attention either locally or or nationally and that that's really important to 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 show uh, people or politicians uh, that this is actually uh, an environmental issue so after you in in one local community have had an issue with a road uh, over some uh, carbon storage, uh, natural carbon storage, then they learn so much about that that they will be um, talking about that in other cases also. And, and when we uh, worked with uh, oil drilling in Lofoten, Vesterolen and Senja, we, we got so many politicians that never have worked with env environmental issues before, but that suddenly were the biggest protectors of uh, Norwegian fish stocks <laughs> in other cases also. So um, we often hear from from our op opposition that these simple cases is, is like simple politics. It's a bad thing, but we really think it's an important thing to to build up these symbols on what is the environmental issue uh, locally that shows um, that there's a global problem. Th that this is like the test on whether Norway has any. Um, um, is is on the right track is if they vote against this project or not. So that's uh, our most successful recipe, I think. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you all. Anna Kvamsos, Marianne Muril, Sol Muller, Teresa Voyet, thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences with us. I think we just started the conversation that we can for sure continue in other arenas. And so I just want to thank you all very, very much.